So I, I will give an introduction on Pathe Integral Monte Carlo uh, applied to continuous systems. Uh, this is the outline. I will introduce this discrete asset Pathe Integral representation of the observables of interest. Then I will present a few examples of calculation of properties, particularly the energy and the superfluid fraction, and then describe a, an algorithm which has been recently extended to continuous systems from lattice models, namely the worm algorithm, that allows for a more efficient calculation of properties related to superfluidity condensation. And it is also much simpler than, than previous algorithms employed in this, in this uh, techniques. Uh, on Monday, as uh, Sebastian was saying, there will be a tutorial hands-on in which we will use a code, a worm algorithm code, to see how crystallization and superfluidity take place in a model of two-dimensional Fourierian system. Um, all the arguments are relatively standard, and they are well described in this in these references. The classical review of modern physics of David Seperly on the integrals for helium. And the worm algorithm described. Huh? Is that better? Okay. And then the other paper is uh, the description of the worm algorithms. Uh, all this paper contains much, much more information than what I'm going to cover today. And here are the sections relevant to the arguments which I will present. Can I erase? So our goal will be the calculation of thermal averages of quantum operators. I think you have seen this many times already. Uh, o is the operator of interest of which we want to calculate the average. E to the minus beta h is the density matrix. Beta is the inverse of the temperature. And the tray and the denominator is the partition function in the canonical ensemble, for instance. We want to do this kind of calculations for Hamiltonians of this kind. And we will take as a reference uh, helium for helium, which is at low temperature and low pressure, a system described by, by point-like particles interacting to a sort of Lennard Jones potential. This potential is extremely accurate for describing helium at low temperature and, uh, and low pressure. And given this Hamiltonian, we are going to do this calculation without any systematic bias. Um, the method is not restricted to this kind of, of uh, Miltonians. So you can have different potentials, for instance, hard sphere to describe cold atoms. Uh, you can have electronic uh, uh, energies to describe uh, interaction between protons when 
the quantum motion of the protons is important. You can three body forces, external potentials, whatever you want. This is just to make uh, uh, examples. Um, we are going to work in the coordinate representation. And so the main object of interest is the matrix element of the density matrix in coordinate representation. Of course, the, the analog of this in classical simulations is uh, an integral of the observable times the, the, the Boltzmann weight. And the Boltzmann weight is explicitly known given the position of the particles. This guy is not explicitly known. But it can be made explicit by introducing uh, auxiliary variables which define a path, as we will see. Um, by the way, this is a method which, is, which has been very successful. The calculation of superfluid fraction of helium-4, a strongly interacting, highly quantum system, starting from the Hamiltonians, done by Seppel and Pollock in 1987, was a major achievement in computational physics. And the method scales well with the number of particles, at least for bosons. And recently, uh, Bolinzeni, Prokofiev, and I have simulated systems with uh, 10,000 kilomatons. And Werner Kraut and uh, Marcus Holtzman have simulated a number of cold atoms of the order of one million, just because the experiment had too few particles. Uh, so it's a very powerful method, and it is in principle exact. We will see in which sense. So we have to deal with this object first. Um, R is the collection of the coordinates of all the particles. And this is the matrix element between two configurations of the system uh, with the temperature uh, 1 over beta. Um, the way we can uh, have an explicit representation of this object is to use the Trotter breakup. e to the minus beta h is equal to e to the minus tau h to the power p, where p is uh, beta over tau. This is obviously an identity. And this is equal to limit for p that goes to infinity of something that we can explicitly represent, namely e to the minus time tau, the kinetic energy, times e to the minus tau, the potential energy. For given p, namely for given tau, this is an approximation. But if p is large enough, the approximation converges to the exact value. So there is no systematic error in this approximation, in the sense you can make the calculation at different, time, at different values of tau and extrapolate at tau equals zero and get the exact, the exact result. Um, an advantage of introducing this approximation, controllable approximation, is that this guy has an explicit representation in, 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 uh, 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 in terms of the coordinates, namely r e to the minus tau t e to the minus tau d r prime is equal to the integral over d r2 of r e to the minus tau t r2 r2 e to the minus tau d r prime. Just inserting a completeness in representation of the coordinates. Now, the potential in our example is local in the coordinate. Um, the matrix element of the potential is R, v, R prime equal V of R times delta of R minus R prime. So this term is trivial. You see to the minus 
tau v of r and uh, brings a delta which uh, uh, eliminates uh, r second. Now let's deal with uh, the kinetic term. The kinetic energy is diagonal in k space. So let me introduce two completeness, k and k prime. In the above expression, r, k, k, e to the minus tau kinetic energy operator, k prime, k prime, r prime, times v of, uh, times e to the minus Uh, tau v of r prime, right? So I've done the integral over r2 using this uh, property and i now dealing with the kinetic energy term. Now the kinetic energy term, k, t, k prime is uh, lambda. I, I guess I forgot to define lambda in the previous is h bar square over 2m. We assume we have all particles, all, all equal particles, but it's not a problem to introduce a, a mixture of different kinds of particles. It's only a notational simplification. Uh, lambda uh, k square delta of k minus k prime. So now we use this. Can you read this uh, down there, down, down here? So this is equal to integral um, uh, dk. Uh, let me also use the fact that the eigenfunctions of the uh, momentum operator are plane waves, e to the minus i k r. So you have e to the minus i k r. This is uh, e to the minus tau lambda k square. And then I have uh, e uh, to the i k prime um, k, sorry, r prime. And then I have again e to the minus tau v of r prime. So you see that this is, uh, this integral over k is the Fourier transform k times r minus r prime of a Gaussian e to the minus uh, tau lambda k squared. And the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is again a Gaussian. So this is equal to uh, e to the minus r minus r prime square over 4 lambda tau e to the minus tau v of r prime. So this is an explicit expression for the coordinate representation of this operator here. Now I can use this explicit expression for each of these factors, each of these factors. And I, I obtain this uh, expression, rho of r0, rp, and beta is equal to the integral of d r1, d r2, dot, dot, d r, p minus 1. I have many factors here. I insert a completement, a completement, a completeness uh, among each factor, and I integrate over the corresponding variables. I have um, E 
e to the minus r0 minus r1 square over 4 lambda epsilon e, lambda tau e to the minus tau v of r1 or r0 whatever you want times uh, this is the first one many products like this up to the last one e to the minus r p minus 1 minus r p square over 4 lambda epsilon e to the minus tau v of r uh, I think either I take 1 or I take p minus 1 okay Now, with this guy, I can go and calculate my observable. I have to make the product of this times uh, the uh, coordinate representation of the operator and then take the trace. Is that clear? Is that too obvious? Probably yes. Let me make the assumption, which is only to simplify the notation, that O is also local in space. So the average of the observable is, is equal to integral over dx, where I have introduced the notation x is equal to the sequence r0 dot 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 rp. Um, r1 rp. Then I have the operator O of R, uh, say, 0. And then I have uh, all these products. Each term of this product, let me call it rho 0 of R0 minus R1 and tau. This is the part of, of the uh, uh, high temperature density matrix that corresponds to the kinetic energy alone. So this is uh, uh, the density matrix of uh, non-interacting particles without any external potential. This is zero means free particles and e to the minus tau v r1. Then I have the product of all these terms. I from one to p, rho zero of r i minus one to r i in time tau. Uh, times e to the minus uh, tau v of r i. This is the numerator. Because I have to take the trace, I have the boundary condition that uh, r e is equal to r zero. So I have the sequence r zero, r one, and so on and so forth, and then I go back to r zero at the last point. And then I integrate over R0, and this is the trace. And the numerator is, uh, is uh, the same without the factor O of R0. Uh, just, uh, let me just write zeta. It's the same thing, except you don't have this factor, the, the denominator. Now let us look at this guy. We have an integral in many dimensions. If we had three n dimensions before, we have now three n p dimensions because we have all these guys to integrate over. But the integral is what is something that depends on the operator that I want to calculate times product of Gaussians times products of exponentials. These are all positive terms, and this is why we choose to work in a coordinate representation. In this representation, we have this integral 
uh, which uh, has a factor in, in the integral which, is, which, is, which can be interpreted as a probability distribution. Let me call it pi of x. Pi is this product of Gaussians times exponentials. And basically, that's it. You have something which you know you can calculate with Monte Carlo using a Metropolis algorithm. You have a configuration space defined by these guys. You move these configurations with a suitable algorithm. You calculate a set of independent configuration xi. configurations, and then you estimate your observables as 1 over k, the average of O of R0 for the configuration I. This is like a classical simulation. Instead of the Boltzmann weight, you have a slightly more complicated object. And then you have something else, and you just sample the distribution, and you get the result with a statistical error, which decreases this one over square root of k if the variance of uh, omega is finite, namely if the integral of O square times the same pi is finite. Um, this is indeed a, a mapping of the quantum problem into a classical one which can be visualized in terms of paths. The paths are these guys here. So let me make a few drawings. Can I erase this? X is a path. Uh, uh, one to R K. Let me also include R zero. Um, let me draw a path for a system of two particles. Particle one at time uh, zero is here. Particle one at time one is there. This is the first particle and the second one is here. And so on and so forth. So the system follows uh, this, uh, this trajectory here. In, uh, say, imaginary time, you can interpret this uh, uh, density matrix uh, at inverse temperature beta as a evolution in imaginary time beta. So this can be viewed as an evolution of the system in imaginary time through these steps. So this is the path. This is a possible representation of the path. There is another representation, which is called word line, which is very useful. Uh, where you have a space here, I can only draw one coordinate, and time there. And the time goes from zero to beta. And you have a, um, This uh, discretized 10 steps, uh, which uh, uh, define the oops, I forgot one, which define the position of the particles at uh, each 10 step. Uh. The trajectories are continuous but not differentiable, and they 
represent the motion of each particle. Note that uh, as here the particle comes back to the original position, also here particle one starts from here and goes back to the same point. The same for particle two. So each particle is uh, mapped onto a polymer. This is a classical polymer of which uh, these things here are the Boltzmann weight. This is this peculiar interaction we have. If you see the, the exponent of this as a potential energy of the polymer system, you see that the polymers have a spring between adjacent, adjacent terms. So there is a spring here. This harmonic term. And the particles interact at equal time. R11 interacts with R21. R1, T3 interacts with R23. But the potential doesn't mix different times. So it's a kind of peculiar, it's not a real polymer, but uh, it's still a classical system that you can treat with the methods that you know. Uh, an important characteristic of these uh, trajectories is the amount of space that they can travel in one time step. Xi minus Xi plus one, the modulus of this, is uh, of the order of two lambda uh, tau. The thermal wavelength at the temperature corresponding to the single time step. Why is this? Because otherwise this Gaussian, if the distance between R1 and R and the next time is much larger, much, much larger than this variance, and then this term vanishes. And the statistical weight of this configuration is basically zero. So the only configurations we have decent statistical weights are those to satisfy this condition. And the whole polymer is a spread, which is the thermal wavelength of corresponding to the low temperature, one over beta. So the spread of the polymer can be larger than the movement in a single time step, but it is of the order of square root of two lambda beta. Now let's see what happens when we start from a high temperature and we decrease the temperature in terms of this path. Let's again consider two particles. This is a high temperature uh, um, trajectory for particle one, and this is a high temperature trajectory for particle two. Uh, at a very high temperature, this, these numbers are very small. Td is the degeneracy temperature of this system, of this quantum system. At the degenerate temperature of, of, this, of the system, the paths are so long then that they can get close to each other. You see why? Because the spread of the polymer is square root of two lambda beta. If I lower the temperature, I increase beta, I increase the spread of this path until they touch. At this point, it is important to consider exchange between quantum particles. And we have to make a slight change in the formalism that we have outlined above. Yes. Yes, of course. Yeah. Thanks. Our particles so far maintain their identity. Particle one closes on the initial position of particle one. Particle two closes on the initial position of particle two. They never exchange. 
in this, in this situation, when the temperature is of the order or lower than the degeneracy temperature, in terms of uh, the world line, the, the picture of world line zero, beta, and this is space, there is this kind of configurations, which do contribute uh, to the integral because they have a, a large statistical weight. But there is also this configuration here. In which particle one ends up where particle two started. So this is a path with an exchange. And for a quantum system at low temperature, we have also to include these configurations in our integral to get meaningful results. And to do this, we define, we symmetrize the density matrix. We consider all possible permutations and we allow each particle to close on any permutation of the, of the other particle. Let, this is an example. This is for bosons. Do we have to make an independent simulation for, all, for each kind of, sim, of permutations? No. If we set up an algorithm which changes not only the positions of the particle, but also the permutation, we can sample this sum just in the same way as we sample the spatial part of the integral. So the algorithm will take care of uh, this uh, sum, which is impractical to calculate explicitly. So we have to devise moves that can switch between different permutation sectors. Okay. This is the, uh, I would say, only complication for fermions. Everything else remains as before. This is again a product of Gaussian time exponentials, and this is a positive thing. There are no minus signs here. We can continue. We only have to include in our algorithm something that can allow particle exchanges. Let me open a parenthesis for fermions. In this case, I would have rho r r prime beta goes into one over n factorial, uh, sum of all the permutations, minus one to the parity of the permutation, xi of p, rho of p r, r prime beta. In this case, the probability distribution pi of x, composed of products of Gaussian and exponentials, now includes, my included sign, a minus sign. And I can write it in this way. So I can continue doing my calculation of the observable. O will be equal to integral dx, O of R0, S of x, phi of x divided, integral dx, sine of x, phi of x. Then I can divide the numerator, uh, denominator by the normalization, the x uh, modulus of modulus of phi of x, um, divide the integral dx modulus of pi of x. So you see that both the numerator and the, the denominator are things that I can calculate. Uh, see, here I have divided and multiplied by one. Both the numerator and the denominator are suitable to a Monte Carlo calculation. The numerator has a positive probability distribution times something that I average over. And the same is true for the denominator. And the estimate of this over k independent configuration would be 
um, summation of i o of r zero of the configuration i times sine of xi. And the denominator is summation of i of the signs. So what's the problem with this? I can do this calculation. It is still exact as before, apart from the 10-step discretization. The problem is that this average sign is exponentially small in the number of particles and the inverse temperature. So I cannot do many fermions, and I cannot do low temperature fermions. So I will give up with fermions. This is just because I do the integrals by Monte Carlo. And this is an example of the fermion sign problem. So no fermions. Unfortunately. There are approximate fermion in, but integral methods which are never, ne neither very efficient nor really tested against accuracy. So it's a very hard and open problem, finding a useful approximation for fermion but integrals. So let's go back to bosons. Now uh, it's a completely classical problem, and uh, you can go and calculate, uh, and calculate the properties. Uh, for instance, the energy. I can uh, use this definition here. And... Uh, I will have to calculate um, um, and then all the other factors, right? And divide it this and the x. Uh, this is slightly complicated because I have to do this derivatives. And there is a better way to calculate the energy. The energy is also uh, minus 1 over zeta, the derivative of zeta with respect to beta. This is a thermodynamic definition of the energy in terms of the partition function. And zeta is the integral of all these guys. And I can take the derivative on the link that I want, on the, on the factor that I want. So I change a beta by changing one of the time steps in the middle. So I can do the, this derivative for one link only. And the, the, um, the derivative uh, uh, with respect to tau now, because I take the derivative of one link, of e to the minus r0, say, minus r1, square over 4 lambda, epsilon, 4 lambda tau, times e to the minus tau uh, v of r0 is, uh, oh, here I have to, so far I have uh, neglected the normalization of the Gaussians, because I always have uh, a Gaussian in the numerator and the same Gaussian in the denominator. But now I have to take the derivative of this Gaussian, and the normalization, the normalization does depend on tau. I have to include it. And so this is uh, 4 lambda pi tau to the power 3 uh, n half. So when I differentiate the denominator, I have a factor uh, um, 3 n over to tau times the exponential times the Gaussian. This 
Dai, times um, rod zero e to the minus tau v. Uh, when I differentiate this. Now differentiate this, I have uh, uh, minus, probably here, minus plus here, minus r minus r1 square of uh, for lambda tau square, and then I have plus uh, uh, times exponential times Gaussian, and I have a plus V of, let's see here. So you see that uh, by doing this calculation, I have something times the original probability distribution. So I do not alter the probability distribution. I keep sampling this. And this will be my estimator of the energy, which I can average over all these slices if I want. One over P, number of slices. This will be I. This will be I plus one. And there will be a summation over I from one to P. I can use any slice of, of the path to increase the statistics of my calculation. Okay, so this is uh, the calculation of uh, of the energy as an example of observables that they can obtain. Uh, people have calculated all sort of structural properties, uh, uh, even uh, even uh, excitation spectrum through uh, analytic continuation of this imaginary time evolution all sort of quantities, uh, condensed fraction, super free fraction. Now we're going to see the super free fraction calculation now. So this, is also, this was only one possible example. The other example, more interesting, is the super free fraction. We can define the super free fraction thinking of a cylindrical vessel which is uh, set on rotation slowly with helium originally at rest. If the helium is in the normal fluid phase, then it will follow the rotation of the vessel. If it is superfluid, it will stay at rest. It is like if, if it had no moment of inertia. So the superfluid can be represented by a lack of moment of inertia. So the normal fraction of, of, uh, of, uh, of the liquid is 1 minus the superfluid fraction of the liquid. And this is equal to the actual moment of inertia divided by EC. EC would, IC would be the uh, moment of inertia of, of the classical system, of the normal fluid. So you see that uh, uh, rho S, the superfluid fraction, is the missing fraction of the moment of inertia. If the moment of inertia is uh, a zero, uh, then rho s will be one. If the moment of inertia is equal to the classical moment of inertia, then rho s will be zero. So this is the definition that we use. What we need to calculate to, to, to compute the, the superfluid fraction, the moment of inertia. The moment of inertia is defined as the um, derivative of the angular momentum with respect to the angular velocity at angular velocity equals zero. We are not in a position to simulate a, a rotating system which, will, which is a time-dependent stuff. What we simulate, what we imagine to simulate is the uh, rest system in a rotating frame. And the density matrix uh, changes accordingly because of the rotating frame. So we are going to, to do this uh, 
derivative in the rotating frame, then we set omega equal to zero, and we go back to the uh, uh, rest uh, frame where, where, where you can do the calculation. So we have to use this in this, uh, in this derivative here. This is the trace of L times uh, many terms uh, which came, which came from the Trotter breakup of this guy. When I take the derivative with respect to uh, omega, I get a factor uh, tau L. The derivative of the first factor. Then I take the, the derivative of the second factor here, plus L, always minus tau H minus omega L. L, this comes from this derivative, e to the minus tau H minus omega L, and so on and so forth. And I have one of these terms for each of the factors that I have uh, introduced in the Trotter breakup. Then I let omega go to zero. By the way, the derivative of zeta doesn't contribute in the, in the limit of omega to zero. There would be a term also from, from uh, the denominator, but it doesn't contribute in the limit of omega equal to zero. You can check it. It contains average powers of average of the angular momentum, and at omega equal zero, this, these guys are zero. So. Uh, we don't need to, to consider the denominator. And uh, this guy at omega equals zero is equal to this of the square is <laughs> omega scone. And you see that this is our original density matrix, and we can do the same simulation as before. We just need to calculate the effect of these guys on the, sh the short time density matrix. L in coordinate representation is summation of all, of all the particle um, I, H, derivative with respect to theta. So let's say L is the zeta component. This is the particle Ri, and this is theta i. And, and this is a de derivative of this guy here in coordinate representation. So we have derivatives of, the, this guy contains the Gaussian of the kinetic energy operator and the exponential of the potential operator. Uh, the contribution from the potential operator, if the potential is a pair potential of a spherical, a spherical interaction, is uh, zero. You can do the derivative and test it explicitly. So only the kinetic energy contributes. So the terms that we have to consider to do these derivatives are of the kind. Derivative with respect to theta, of e to the minus, uh, say, x minus x prime square minus y minus y prime square. This is the factor in the Gaussian that depends on the angle theta for a given particle. The zeta component doesn't depend on theta. The potential has a zero derivative with respect to theta. And this is the only part that depends on theta. 
So for each link, I only have to take this derivative for, for each factor of L that appears here. Now x is equal to r cos theta, so um, d theta x is equal minus y and d theta y d theta y is equal to x. So let's do this derivative, uh, and this is uh, uh, two x minus x uh, time times uh, minus y. And this guy uh, times uh, the, the Gaussian. So I, I forgot all these factors in the Gaussian and, and signs and so on and so forth. But this is basically the object that we need. Uh, and we have 2xy minus 2xy is 0. And what is left is 2xy um, prime minus uh, yx prime, which is equal to twice r vector product with r prime. r is the, well, I should put another name, but this is the planar component of the vector. So this is the uh, result of applying uh, uh, the angular momentum to one of these guys. And uh, let me do a picture here. I have, here is the zeta axis. This is r at time, particle i time j, particle i time j plus 1, and so on and so forth. And the vector product is, is uh, twice this area. And you see that they have a contribution from the first uh, time step, the second time step, the third time step, and so on and so forth. So I have this area, I have this area, this area, and if this is the projected part of this particle, particle moves in imaginary time along the path, and there is a projected area. And this guy gives the projected area of this particle. Because I have a term for each time slice. First, second, third, and so on and so forth. There is one special slice, which is the first one. I have L square here. So I have to take another derivative of this guy, of uh, this guy. Of, uh, of the quantity of the Gaussian is equal to, so I Differentiate the Gaussian once more, and I have the square of what I had before. For and then I have another term in which I have to differentiate this, which is a factor which now appears in front of the Gaussian in the first derivative. So the first derivative is uh, this guy times the Gaussian. When I differentiate the Gaussian once more, I have the square of this. Now I differentiate this. And this guy gives a contribution, I'm not sure about this sign, plus, plus or minus uh, twice x, x prime plus y, y prime. So now I have one of these objects which comes from this L square. And then for each of these terms in the sum, I have twice L, the 
product of two L's. The product of two L's produces something which is the square of the area. And this special term here is the classical moment of inertia. Let me just try the thing and uh, Remember that L is a summation over all the particles. I erase it. And this is a summation of all the particles. And this summation over J is the sequence of these terms. And so I have one factor of this. I have another factor of this because I have two L's. And I have a factor, a term I, I see, which is summation over I and J of M R I dot R perpendicular. So the term that comes from the uh, L square here gives a factor which is proportional to the classical moment of inertia. And all the other guys give the square of this projected area. Huh? Everything comes from uh, uh, the definition of the moment of inertia, writing the angular momentum in a rotating frame, taking the derivative, and using this then you have to put all the factors together and all the indices of the particles and things like that. But eventually the result is the super the fluid fraction is 2m over beta lambda classical moment of inertia times the average of the square of the area. So this is the result of the super fluid fraction of this rotating, uh, of this uh, uh, helium in the cylindrical and the cylindrical vessel. Why is it interesting? Uh, well, it tells you two things. One is that uh, it doesn't matter how many helium atoms you have. Uh, this is a definition of superfluidity, which doesn't require a bulk phase transition, but it also manifests itself in small systems. There are experiments which uh, see manifestation of superfluidity in helium cluster with as few as four or five particles. And a calculation of this guy reproduces quantitatively the experiments. Um, and the other thing is that uh, because the superfluid fraction is proportional to this area, we have some implication on how the paths are distributed. So imagine you have your cylinder here, at high temperature you have small parts with no exchanges. Each of these, uh, maybe a few exchanges. This guy has two particles, and this guy has maybe three. So th these are the parts of all the particles, huh? view from above in this cylinder. What is the area? Each of these particles has a direction, random. So these are small numbers that other subtract incoherently. The superfluid fraction is zero. See why? No, there is no area. This, uh, this is maybe plus, this is minus, and this is only this configuration. You average over only small areas with opposite signs. The, the area here is summation of, of, over all the particles. So if these particles if this particle goes this way and the other goes that way, they cancel each other. So how can you possibly have superfluidity? You have to have a big area, such as this one. No matter what other particles do, this will prevail and will give a signal of superfluidity. How can you have 
such a long part by having a long um, exchange cycles. This guy contains many particles. The only way you can have superfluidity is through a long permutation cycle. And this you read directly from the fact that the superfluid is proportional to the area squared. And this is the only way you can get a big area in this case. So in this classical mapping, mapping between quantum particles and, uh, and uh, ring polymers, but uh, inter interlaced ring polymers, one can go. We have this totally classical picture of the superfluid fraction. Totally classical because you simulate this as a classical system, which is, I think, interesting to me. In periodic boundary condition, this is for a finite system. In periodic boundary condition, you can use the same result by imagining to have now two very large cylinder. R is the radius, and D is the spacing between the, 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 the cylinders. And the, and the helium, the the, body, the helium system is inside here. So this is, at least in this uh, direction here, like a periodic boundary condition, you see. But if you apply this formula to the superfluid fraction along zeta, uh, for rotations along zeta of this guy, you see that the only path which have a large area are these guys here. If one goes to some distance, in one direction, and goes back, this, this, is, this is a small area, this is small. The only big possible big area is this. Now, if you imagine that this is now the periodic boundary of this, and you open this, you see that in periodic boundary conditions, the only paths which contribute to the superfluid fraction are, are those which, by exchanging to many particles, wind around the boundary condition. This is a path with one the number L. This is a path with one the number zero. Only these guys, in the thermodynamic limit, contribute to the superfluid fraction. And this, again, you learn from this area estimator in a cylindrical symmetry adapted to the, to the uh, periodic boundary condition case. In terms of this winding number, for uh, Rho S in PBC, this becomes uh, Rho S is equal to W square 1 over 2 lambda beta L. So this is the area, you define the winding number as summation I j of r i time j plus 1 minus r i time j. This is the definition of a winding number. This is something that adds uh, all the displacements along the path. In this case, you have a net displacement. In this case, you have a zero uh, zero displacement and all this. So the only ones that do contribute to the superfluid fraction are those who wind around the boundary conditions. And again, this is a consequence of this area estimator, yes. What's the relation between winding number and The relation between winding number and area. The relation between winding number and area. No, no, what is the relation? No, it's not The relation between winding number and? No, 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 only the relation, not the same here. Oh, you
This is better. So this is the second and last example of calculating properties. I think this is particularly interesting. And now we move uh, to a description of the algorithm to simulate this, to, to, to calculate these integrals. This is a path for a system uh, in which uh, uh, there is a winding number non-zero. Since each particle cannot move too much in a, from zero to beta, this has to include many particles. Uh, this is a long permutation cycle. And it is an important quantity to change the winding number because we, we want to make statistics of uh, we, have, we want to have fluctuating quantity and to have a, an average of this. We don't have, we don't want to have a configuration that gets stuck and never changes. We want to be able to change this. It, it is extremely difficult with ring polymers. First of all, let me make a, a draw of uh, two particles. If we want to implement an exchange with closed polymers, these are two polymers, we have to cut them and, and try to reconnect them in this way. So we have to move at least two particles. But we, if, you, if you try to attempt two particle exchanges here, nothing happens to the winding number, for instance. I can include this guy in the permutation cycle. We have a few particle exchanges. But the winding number didn't change. I can get rid of this guy. But the winding number didn't change. So the only way to change the winding number is to propose a global move which contains more or less all the particles of the cycle. The number of the, uh, of the particles uh, uh, that I have to include are roughly the size of the simulation box divided by the number uh, small. This is the number of uh, particles that I have to include in a move if I have to change the winding number. It's about the, the, the linear distance uh, the linear size of the simulation box divided by the interparticle distance, something like this. And this is, uh, this is a large number. So you can imagine that constructing an exchange between many particles and reconstructing the path of all these particles to reconnect in a different way is, uh, is absolutely a nightmare. So, this uh, way of calculating the superfluid fraction with uh, closed polymers has been successful for, uh, say, 100 particles, not more. With the worm algorithm that I'm going to describe now, you can, you can calculate uh, 10,000 particles, whatever. And the idea is uh, what happens is if I am allowed to cut open one of these rings. So let me draw here a path. With perhaps too many particles, but anyway. 
suppose I am allowed to include the configuration in my configuration space in which this is broken. Now I start moving this guy. I'm going to move only one particle at a time, not even two, one particle at a time. And I move this particle like this. And if I accept the move, I cancel this. So this is now a continuous line. I accepted the move. Now I can move this particle and perhaps goes here. If I accept the move, this is the new configuration. And if I continue, um, I perhaps go and reconnect with this guy. So here with a sequence of four moves of one particle, I have killed the winding number. This is a pictorial example that should show you that it's easier to change the winding number if you are allowed to have an open polymer amongst the others. So this is what we are going to do with the worm algorithm. We have to, um, we have to have not only closed path, perhaps exchange or whatever, but also an open path. This is a configuration of new kind that we have to include, we have. We want to include in our sampling because we believe that this guy will be able eventually to change the winding number easier. Um, so we want to use this configuration. And what do, do we need to use the configuration? We, not, we, we, we have to need the statistical weight of the configuration because this is what enters in the Monte Carlo calculation. Uh, I, happens, I happen to generate this configuration. I have to decide whether accept or reject it. What is the statistical weight of this? It's no different from, from what we did earlier. We can calculate the statistical weight of this configuration despite the fact that seemingly is different from before. Just looking at what happens in one link. Let's take this link. A link is a sequence of two connected uh, time slices. This link has three particles. And the contribution of, uh, of uh, this link to uh, the statistical weight of the configuration is uh, rho, um, say this is time j, j plus 1, r, j, r, j plus 1, and tau. And then I multiply the statistical weight of each link, including these guys. When I come to this point, I will have rho of rk, rk plus 1 and tau. Rho is product of a Gaussian times an exponential. And the only difference between this guy and this guy is that this, this one has n particles, and this one has n plus 1 particles. So I can add a factor for each link, and I reconstruct the, the statistical weight of this configuration without any problem with respect to the previous uh, situation. Uh, let's be a little bit more formal. I'm going to uh, sample configurations which correspond to a generalized uh, partition function, which is now equal to zeta plus C times zeta prime. Zeta is, in a sense, the old uh, partition function. However, since now we have to be able to change the number of particles, it's not going to be the canonical partition function, but the grand canonical partition function. Zeta corresponds to a situation where there is no this guy. Huh? Maybe the, the number of particles can change. For instance, this guy can grow, and I have a different number. When I have a, a configuration with closed rings, 
they contribute to the canonical partition function. When I have a configuration with an open thing, this contributes to the green function, to the one particle green function of the system. The one particle green function of the system is the amplitude to create a particle here at this time and to destroy the particle there, thermal average at equilibrium with the other particles. Call this M and this I. This is tau times JM. This is tau times JI. This is position RI, and this is position RM. If I integrate over all the other variables, this is a function of I of RI and RM. Tau TI and TM this function here. And this pseudo partition function is the sum of all the statistical weights, namely including integration over these variables. And G is um, Thermal average of the, of the uh, amplitude to create the particle at this time and to destroy the particle, the, the particle at the other time in the other position. Uh, tau J mash. Okay, this is just because this is a physical quantity, which is known as the one particle Green's function. And it is interesting because at time zero, it is uh, the one body density matrix. So it gives you a way to calculate the one body density matrix. But apart from the name, the integral over the sum over all the statistical weights of these configurations is the generalized uh, partition function of the worm algorithm. So apart from the formalism, the, the algorithm proceeds as before, except we have new configurations. Now, how do we move this configuration? Oh, by the way, there is this C. So when there is no, this is called the worm. When there is no, no worm, the configuration contributes to the canonical partition function. And it is called the zeta sector. When there is a worm, this contributes to the Green's function, and it is called the G sector. Yes? Do we allow for more or more than one worm? We can, uh, we can uh, put them as many as we want, but for the purpose of uh, speeding up the uh, simulation in the sense of uh, changing the winding numbers of things, this is just a complication and not an advantage. If you are interested in two-body Green's function, for instance, if you were able to simulate fermions, Maybe we wanted to see pairing and things like this, and that would be extremely interesting. There is no problem at all. You draw another line, these are the new configuration, and, and that's it. You only have to devise moves that switch, move all the coordinates, switch from this sector, from this, uh, from this sector to this sector, and, and possibly change the winding number. And uh, I'm sketching the kind of moves of the worm algorithm now. So. So we have to be able to move the coordinates, uh, uh, displace uh, these uh, points where the swarm is, uh, and to switch between the sector with worm or without worm. And there are pairs of uh, 
moves, one of which is the reverse of the other. Uh, And there is a kind of move which is the complementary, so, uh, the complementary of itself. Um, in certain remove are this kind of moves. They move from zeta to G sector. And, if there is no worm, I can attempt to insert one. If there is a worm, I can attempt to remove it. Open close means that, uh, suppose I have uh, two closed parts, I attempt to open it one of them. If I open it, this disappears, and this becomes a worm. Close is, I can close a worm. This guy, there is a worm, I can continue the worm, or I can try to remove part of the work. And swap is most useful for the super fraction, and it is like this. Um, this is the worm, and I have other particles. And starting from this point, I look at some time after, and I maybe connect this worm with uh, this position. And if the move is accepted, this guy disappears, and this becomes the new head of the worm. Well, let me do it again. This is the old configuration. I try to connect this with the part with an existing particle sometimes later, sometime later, and if the move is accepted, this guy is removed. Uh, and this kind of moves is sufficient to sample the whole configuration space. So you say, you never, you never touch this guy. Well, I have just to wait until a worm comes, a worm comes here and swaps with this guy. Then I begin to move this guy. So just by moving the worm, I can touch sooner or later all the, all the, all the word lines and change the configuration completely. Um, let me just make one example of the proposal transition, the a priori proposal transition matrix and the acceptance rate of the osmos. Uh, let's take swap, which is the most important. So let's make a bigger picture. This is a move that happens in the G sector and remains in the G sector. So there has to be a worm. Here it is. There have to be other particles, perhaps exchanging. So this is our initial configuration. Starting from the head of the worm, I consider the positions of all the particles m times steps later. m is the parameter of the algorithm. In the Metropolis algorithm, you have a size of the move. If you make small moves, you always accept, but you don't get anywhere. If you make larger move, you always reject, and you don't get anywhere. You have to fix the size of the m is the size of the movie parameter. 
so it has to be chosen appropriately. So, um, um, So I take it, all the particles m times steps later and pick one of them. I pick one of them with this probability. Ri is the collection of these particles at this time te step here. One of them is called R zeta. This is the probability with which I choose zeta. It's probably the closest, but not always. other symbols, S, 0, minus S, 1, uh, tau, uh, 0 of S, 1, minus S, 2, tau, rho, 0 of S, M, minus 1, S, M, tau. I sample these guys, these rho zero are Gaussians, are the non-interacting particle propagators. With S zero equal Ri, and Sm equal R zeta. So I do a Levy construction. You have seen the Levy construction yesterday, I guess. From here to there. By the way, the Levy construction actually samples this divided rho zero of s zero minus s m uh, m tau. This is a factor that comes from the probability of the Levy construction. We have to take it into account for the room. But basically you 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 make a brown and bridge, a random walk, Gaussian random walk starting from I and then and then the then we, we have to know the probability of the reverse move. I'm sorry, I'm late. I'm trying to speed up. The reverse move, so if this is accepted, I will have a R alpha, which is going back from here. The reverse move will be the one in which this is the head of the worm, and it would like to close in this position. And the reverse move would have sampled rho 0 of t0 minus t1 tau dot dot rho 0 of uh, tm t, uh, m minus 1 tm and time tau, where T zero equal R alpha and T M equal R zeta. So this will be the uh, divided rho zero of S uh, T zero minus T M in time M tau. The acceptance probability is the minimum between 1 and pi of x prime divided pi of x. Uh, this is statistical weight of the new configuration, statistical weight of the old configuration. 
multiplied the probability of the reverse move, multiplied this guy, let me call it T, x prime x, and this is T x x prime. And I have no time to do all the calculations, but what, uh, what you have is that this is a rho zero divided by this summation I call sigma, uh, sigma i. And this summation I didn't write the, the probability of choosing R zeta starting from R alpha. It's, this, it's similar to this guy, except you have uh, alpha instead of I. So eventually, the, 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 the probability of accepting the move is uh, minimum between 1 and e to the uh, minus delta V, the change in the potential of the, from the new and the old configuration, times uh, sigma I divided sigma alpha, or vice versa. I didn't have time to, to do the whole calculation, but this is kind of similar to the result. So let me just recap the idea. You, you define a certain kind of move. You define the rules with which you choose to do this move. And uh, you calculate, you know, all the ingredients, you know, this is the Levy construction, and this is the uh, Metropolis algorithm. And in this, uh, in this uh, formula here, what appear are the probability in the new and the old configuration times the transition probability of making the direct and the reverse move. I apologize that I didn't have time to go through them step by step, but uh, more or less uh, just thinking in terms of uh, statistical weights of the configuration and defining the probability of attempting the move, you get the rules for each of the kind of move, which define the warm algorithm. And on Monday, we will see this algorithm at work for uh, through the phase diagram of helium form. Thank you.